Do you have a fish tank running? Like, what is that sound I hear? Hold on. It is a fish tank. Hold on. It's my uh, it's my space heater. One second. Oh, the space heater. The infamous space heater. I was hoping that you would do your, like, little... You can't hear me. But I was hoping that you would do your little, like, roll away. Oh, I'll say it again. Yeah, it's shutting Did down. Did you hear anything I said? No. I said I was hoping that you do your little roll away action <laughs> on the chair. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that was uh, that was not necessarily a good segue. That was on cue about my space heater being on and it not feeling like summer. Because uh, oh, yeah, right it's on still chilly. Cue. It is right. Oh, no, not yeah. here. Uh, look at no? me. I'm so sunburned. <laughs> I'm like. Yeah, you did get I, some color, dude. I wore sunscreen today and yesterday and spent so much time outside. And you and I already talked about this. We. I've been in our yards all weekend long. And <laughs> yeah. I had we had to delay the start of recording episode 143 by 30 yeah. minutes because I needed a shower. It looked like my fingernails looked like I had just buried a body in like, the <laughs> dirt. I couldn't believe how disgusting they were. And then I had a random thought in the shower. And a shout out to uh, the subreddit Shower Thoughts. I don't follow it, but if you're a Shower or Thoughts uh, redditor, good on you. I just got mm. sick of their boring Shower Thoughts. <laughs> One of my Shower Thoughts was I don't remember really anything about the dorm showers at all. Like, oh. I can't even tell you anything about it. And I feel like I was at least in there 100 and plus times, at least. And I don't yeah. remember anything. Do you at all? Uh, well, so there's a picture of me getting ice oh, right. shaved into the back of my yeah. head. I uh, forgot about that. Which that was, I don't know if the showers are in there, but it's close to the showers. But yeah, man, I don't remember. I, I don't remember. Uh, Yuri and I were actually just talking about this. Her brother was an RA at the dorms at Western Washington. And I was thinking about it, I was like, man, an RA really is just like a camp counselor. Like that's what <laughs> yeah, freshman year yeah. at college was like, is it was just like That's so camp. true. Yeah. That is so just, true. Yeah. And yeah. none of them want to get anyone in real trouble. Like they're just like, come on. Like you, it's the disappointed camp counselor where they're like, really? <laughs> Again? Yeah. Didn't we already yeah. do this? Didn't you already get busted for this? Yeah. Man. Wait, who was- shout out. Shout out to the RAs who yes. uh, do it for like multiple years because that is oh. – that's intense. I feel like after one year, I'd go insane. I'd go insane. Yeah. yeah. Dude, I still uh, – I wouldn't say like correspond with my RA, but uh, I still – we follow each other on Instagram. No, well, there you go. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what happened to my RA. Shout out Jace to wherever you're at. Ah, but living the life in Bend. I know you're in Bend. At least the last I saw you were in Bend. Total country dude, just a a massive human being served in like in the army, not ROTC, but like the actual army. He was like a 30 year old RA (laughs) when we were freshmen because he was finishing his degree after like serving tours. Yeah. uh, Yeah. He was, he could be intense sometimes, but he was a funny dude. Jay Stu, if you're listening, shout out to you, man. Yeah. And you were, what, what dorm were you in? Holly Hall, baby. Holly, Holly Hall. Holly second right. floor. Yeah. Holly that's second right. floor all day. Man. That's right. Yeah. And I was going to ask too, like, I bet you my showers were probably so glamorous compared to yours in the polling projects. Oh, my you, God. There was disease and mold growing under the cracked tiles of yours. Oh. And I had, I had marble in my bathroom. What I dude, I'm that pretty way. sure I'm pretty sure ours were like the mismatched like tricolor, but they're all tan small tiles. You know what I'm talking about? Like it <laughs> oh, reminds yeah. you of a of like a of a cigarette filter after you smoked it, like that kind of tan. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, it like, was or uh, maybe they were white and it was just tan <laughs> because people would smoke cigarettes in the shower. Yeah. That it may be more likely, uh, given at least the 2005 class of polling hall. 
Dude, I, did, I, I don't know if it was just polling, but we had the night where like the power just went out and it was like there wasn't a I remember storm. That. Yeah. I think you I think you uh sent me a uh message on AIM. Then, like that's dating us. <laughs> But I'm pretty sure you sent me a message on AIM, and you're like, dude, it's fucking crazy up here. The power's out. Everyone's going wild in the hallways. And I looked at yeah. I, my my chair to the, my desk was, like, within arm's reach of my door. And I opened my door because right. I'm, like, the power wasn't out for me. And, like, I, like, opened my door, and the, the hallway lights were on. There was no chaos. It was, like, the dichotomy of two very different but connected dorms that uh, demonstrated yeah that we were upper class citizens and uh, i don't really know how you would describe polling but it was like that. it was like the oregon state penitentiary if all of the cells were just <laughs> opened and the power went out that's what it felt like that's it was right around the time yes. where that dude was walking around with this switchblade around the fifth floor do you remember that <laughs> or like a butterfly oh, knife yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you also sent me an AIM message and told me that uh, you were getting a crew ready to fight this guy in case he started <laughs> some shit. But yeah, that was, was like creepy. Uh, I'm playing. I'm playing MVP baseball. I'm I'm good. I'll just gonna hang out down here. <laughs> I don't want to mess with the dude I, with the butterfly knife. Yeah, it was so weird. I I feel like I heard somewhere that polling just got remodeled and it's super nice now. But um, I don't well, know it's about if, time. if there's. Yeah, if there's a listener that has been in polling since it was remodeled, let us know. Cause uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can only think yeah. of polling as a super super ghetto dorm. So, but like, it, what it, is it now? Like, it's a low security penitentiary or something, right? Yeah, it's like a it's like a county county jail, not not a <laughs> <Yeah>. state penitentiary. <laughs> Man, God, there are so many memories in that that quad uh, with Cawthorn. Not <laughs> Cawthorn wasn't even. A it dorm because it, it was it like was just like a ghost a, town, and they were supposed to be doing work on it, but they weren't doing work on it. No, and then yeah. sometimes you would just see like foreign exchange students there for like temporarily, and they would like pop out <laughs> the door like, "What? Someone's in Cawthorn? How did they get <laughs> yeah. in there?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. you see them for like a week, and you're like, "I think they're just visiting," but they put them in Cawthorn. Yeah, if that's as bad as polling, and they haven't done any work on it. Like that yeah. is a, a really bad look for Oregon State. But who Duh. knows? No, I've never, I've still never been in Cawthorn. Me neither. And I always used to think like how cool it would have been if we could have walked in that full circle around circle. the quad. Yeah. It would have made getting yeah. to your room a lot easier for me, I think. Well, yeah, and yours too, because we would have, well, no, we were on opposite corners either way. We were like kitty corner. Oh, that's because true. Buxton was between us or Cawthorn was between us. Yeah. Either way. Yeah. But I remember there were multiple times. And I will say I was not in the sharpest state of mind every time I tried this, maybe once or twice. But I would go to the door on any of the floors I was on in Holly or polling. You know, they had they had the fire doors like connecting the dorms and to yeah. complete the quad. See, by the way, they did lock those at one point for a bit. I think they're reopen where you could not oh. walk between the the uh, different dorm wings. Oh, weird. Uh, yeah, isn't that weird? But but it felt like the sword in the stone. I'd go up to the door and it would like get slow motion and I would reach out to the handle and be like, is today the day it's going to be open? And I would like <laughs> try to open it and it was always locked every single time. And I think one time I was showing somebody you lived with or was friends with someone who lived near you and I was telling them about that and they were like, oh, you know, you can just like climb around the like the fire pipe yeah the fire escape and get in the doors are always unlocked and i was like oh, yeah no, i didn't know that i think it was like the last day of school i think the next day we like all moved out so i've never Dude, been people... to cawthorn bucket list item for yes. sure 100 percent. people we should people do an episode skirt. from cawthorn <laughs> live from cawthorn hall people <laughs> yeah. people skirted around at um that pole thing on the fifth floor of polling i remember that and I wasn't thinking like, oh, you could just go down to the second floor. I was just thinking like, damn, we'll that her. is a really risky move. But yeah, a lot Either of way. stuff happened that, that on that fire escape. Somebody's TV got thrown off there, I remember. I do remember that. Yeah. It was thrown off towards the IM fields. Yep. Yeah. Man, whose TV was that? How did that happen? <laughs> I think it was, uh, it was Ben Vega's, I think. So I think. someone's. 
stole it or he was just fed up with his TV. I don't Whatever. remember. We're not narking. We're not narking on this podcast. Yeah. This is episode <laughs> yeah. 143. Isn't that 143? Isn't that like pager code for love? Yeah. I, I don't know, but uh, well, yeah. No. Maybe. I love you. Yeah. It's I love you. Is it? I think I the one it is for I... one letter, four is for four letters, and three is for three letters. And I just looked it up and it said 143 oh. is code for I love you. Especially oh. used on pagers back in the nineties, oh. which was a just well, a great decade. It makes sense that Terry's not here then. Yeah, he's not a nineties baby. He he wishes <laughs> he'll argue that to death. He also <laughs> wasn't in the quad when we were. He's also not on this episode again. Yeah. So it begs the question: Where's Terry now? He's just always missing. Yeah, I think he's he's still he's still being bougie in Italy. We we talked with him last week, and he gave us the unfortunate news that he has only eaten wings while he was in Italy, or while he was in Italy for the first week. So, needless to say, I was disappointed. Yep, needless to say, so was I, and <laughs> that's why I will not uh, argue for or against the fact that maybe my nails were dirty because I was burying a body. Oh, Harry. Never how dare you not eat podcast. wings? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's still in Italy. Yeah, he's just. It's episode 1,430, and he's still in Italy looking for wings. He's just looking everywhere. He just, just can't find them. Like I said, he won't find them, but I'm glad he did. Uh, I'm yeah. also not glad he hasn't eaten them that often. The last I saw, just to you know, give myself a little bit of an alibi, is that uh, he had recently posted on Instagram from Italy eating pasta like a American. Oh. Whatever. Good on you. Enjoy yourself, Terry. Next week, it's back to this bullshit, and we'll be happy to have you back. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I want to hear about his Italy escapades. It looks like he is having a great time out there. And, uh, yeah, wish him wish him to have a happy, I don't know, three days left of his vacation. I think he's back before the end of the week. He's back before regionals. I know he's that. not coming back. He's, he's, not he's, he's just... buried below a fence post in my backyard. <laughs> a very nice backyard, by the way. Thank it looks, you. It looks excellent. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And so does my sunburn, I guess. I almost was planning to re-bleach my hair and cut it a bit today. And then oh, yeah. I uh, – now I'm really happy I didn't because it would look so white or yellow <laughs> like compared like... to my red face. Yeah, man, it would definitely be a contrast there. I feel like I look like I haven't seen the sun in a year. I look very is pale. Is was- on? It is. Uh, here, let's see what happens if I turn it off. Oh, oh that's really, really dark. dark. Yeah, yeah, it's really dark. Keep it on. Uh, if you're on yeah, YouTube, you saw that. Oh, maybe make sure next time that you're checking us out on YouTube so you can see yeah. what dark Benny looks like. Yeah. Ooh, it's scary. Uh, oh, it sounds but like it a is. scary, creepy child's laugh. <laughs> if it'll play, it won't play. All right, well, Boo. unless you're hearing it. Boo! I'm not hearing it. No. Maybe the listeners Okay, are. that was because it was a joke. Nope. It won't do the mm. sounds. It hates Any of us them? today. Let's try this again. Go live. Uh, ah, there you go. Yeah. Ah, nice, ah, nice. Ah, <laughs> See, hilarious, 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 hilarious. Yes, the sounds are back. Honk twice if you love the beeves. That's yeah. let's go. We'll be bringing that back next week. Yeah, Terry can't wait for the horns. Yeah. Did you just hit something? It no. sounded like a. It oh it's well it Is, sounded like a, um. You know one of those meditation bowls? Boom. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. I haven't heard yeah. one of those in a while. Those are nice, though. Yeah. I think they're like we... called going bowling. I don't know. Going it's... bowling? Yeah. We we were talking about like brown noise and green noise and white noise on the episode maybe last week, maybe a couple weeks last ago. Last week. Right? Terry would never you. allow that. Yeah. yeah Terry would never allow right. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> moving on. Moving on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that goes sort of hand in hand with the with the colored noises. Is those meditation bowls? Those like 
if there's a sound of those uh Ooh. on like the calm app i might go oh, i that bet you there night. is there has I bet there be. is yeah meditation yeah, yeah. bowls not the kind that you're familiar with <laughs> dude my plant so i'm i i still haven't smoked uh since the last time we spoke but i am Whoa. growing yeah i'm growing with my all that plant. free product i know dude it's insane uh the the buds are like huge i'm growing it for my father-in-law yuri's dad uh for a father's day present uh he will enjoy it um but it's like it's almost too much at this point it's really crazy i'll i'll send i'll put a picture on uh on x uh after we get off the episode here nice yeah. i love it i love it yeah um well that's awesome i uh, hopefully you continue to grow plenty of buds yeah. and maybe someday there'll be some for you maybe maybe yeah. maybe yeah i think so maybe until soon. then i mean i guess i'm solo <laughs> On the yeah. uh, Vice's beer segment, the uh, let's just drink because we can on a podcast segment. Yeah. I'm just riffing on names. I think that one sounds all right. That, that sounds um, all right. Well, yeah, what are you drinking? Good question. Good question. I'm actually cracking it right now. Ooh. That was live. That was not a sound effect. That was the real deal. <laughs> Though maybe I should have recorded that and sold it on a sound effect site. But that'd be good. I am drinking a West Coast IPA from Cerebral Brewing called Oh, oh, oh. Yep, yep. Dank trait. Dank trait. Oh, dude, that's a cool can too. I yeah, really well, like that. It can. fits with the it fits with the conversation in a way. Yeah. Dank. Yeah. Do, do people still call weed dank? Or are they I just think like so. is that like an adjective now? Like yeah, that that was dank. I uh, I think it could be both. I uh or do so I just sound really know. chuggy? You might have sounded really chuggy. I think we sound <laughs> chuggy a lot and we may not know it. <laughs> but uh yeah, there's I feel like there is more names for weed than any other like thing. Like not just vices, but thing. There's just a lot yep. of names for it. Yeah. But dank might it's, I think it I think it still is one. Okay, good. Good. Well, yeah. this is Dank Trait. This is, uh, f again, from Cerebral Brewing. I picked this up from Function PDX Northeast. Nice. Cerebral Brewing is their current uh, brewery of the month for the month of May, so you only have four days left to get there. They've done some really good beers. Uh, hmm. I was impressed with pretty much all of the ones I had from Cerebral out at, at Function this last week when we went. Um, hmm. But... But I guess we will cheers to uh, what will be our next segment, and that is the farewells. Yes, and, and we have a couple. We have a couple. We have some not so important. Uh, we have some very important farewells. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but cheers to those included in the list. Yes. Cheers to Terry wherever he lies six feet deep or at a wing <laughs> stop in Italy. Yes, a wing stop. And cheers to your buds, Benny. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, cheers to you. Cheers to you in your nice new backyard. I was really thanks. impressed with those pictures. And my nice new suntan burn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we were probably outside for the same amount of time this weekend. I didn't spend a lot of time out there today, but yesterday I did. Uh, dude, I was so <laughs> sore today. I uh, oh. We had this brick. It was just like two steps from the sort of like ground area in my backyard up to uh, our door. And uh, we had like this concrete slab that led up to that. And so I broke up the concrete slab with a sledgehammer, like not super quick, but like kind of quick. And I got to the stairs and to the stairs probably took me like 80% of the time. It was truly just brick stacked on brick, stacked on brick, stacked on brick. And when I hit the sledgehammer, it felt like, like it did nothing. And I felt like my arms were just reverberating from hitting it. So yeah, I, my body was hating you, me this morning. You got to get uh, like a rotary drill slash hammer oh like a jackhammer well they, yeah but it's like an electric one and you just oh it's like a little handheld one oh 
yeah i've never heard i've of been that. using oh yeah yeah it's like a little like well it's pretty big but it's like a okay. gun and then you just oh. hold like a side and a, and a hit the trigger and poof, jackhammers oh man yeah i, wish I had known about that <laughs> that's what i've been using that's what i was using to break up what i found him when i put up my fence man it was like just layers and layers of bad bad decisions like just <laughs> oh this is a this is a dirt road so i am gonna put a brick paver here oh brick paver sunk so we need something more stable <laughs> let's do a layer of concrete Oh, a layer of concrete is breaking up. Let's just put another layer of concrete on top of it. <laughs> yeah. Like, I dug through so much just absolute chaos, absolute chaos. I was sitting out there just jackhammering away forever. And uh, did I ever tell you, too, like, I I may have stumbled. Um, I, I Shame on me. I did not do a call before you dig. I really should have done it. Oh, yeah. I think. Um in in hindsight, I I wish I would have, but I also did retroactively. But also now I'm worried about that I did because look, the neighbors next to us they have their fence line along the act- same plane as us, and okay. the neighbors on both sides actually. So I'm like, if they've dug post holes here, like it's probably fine, right? Like going right. the same direction. So I'm not uh-huh. in an issue. I don't. I should have any issues. So I'm digging down. First po- first post hole, fine. Next one, fine. The last one, which is close to the structure, the building of the or the uh, external uh, g- garage. And then mm-hmm. I get all the way down, like, I don't know, 18, 20 inches. And I'm like, well, this rock is so hard to get out of this stupid river uh-huh. rock. I was so fed up with the river rocks. And I'm t- using my, my post hole digger and I'm like twisting. <laughs> yeah. And then I look down, I'm like, this is nothing's coming up. I look down and there's just like, thick wire braid sticking out <laughs> oh jesus so i'm like uh okay i'm done i'm done for the day i'm going inside i'm not i don't know and then the next day i go back out there and i'm taking pictures of it i send it to chad gpt oh yeah i'm like this is a wire buried like two feet underground it's like coiled up but with no insulation it's right below what i believe are phone lines in the sky what is it? And I I don't actually know what it is, but oh, uh, the I just kind of like left it and like just poured the concrete anyways. But yeah, that's smart. Uh, yeah, the um the response from ChatGPT was that it's likely an old phone line that they buried, mm. or even a telegraph line. Oh is, shit! Yeah, left you know just left there. Because then I so then I did file a you know dig you know inspection or whatever because I was yeah. freaking out. I'm like I can't keep going and not know and I need to dig a little deeper. But luckily I was I was fine. But yeah, um, I filed the whole thing and then as soon as like I'm like oh I don't need to do this anymore. I don't I should cancel it. I get a notice from them being like we've alerted CenturyLink to come out and inspect your dig. And I'm like shit. I gotta call tomorrow. <laughs> this is yesterday. I'm like tomorrow is. A holiday. I'm gonna yeah. have to like wait two days and hope they don't come out before then because my fence will be up. When they show yeah. up. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna call them tomorrow and hope they don't come. But I'm pretty sure if CenturyLink's coming out, that means it was definitely telephone, if not even something prior to that that was their infrastructure, and um, it was not electrical. Luckily, because it wasn't mm. insulated, I think that was a big giveaway that it's not electrical. Yeah. But then I also found out that it could have been copper, and I could have been hella rich if I just dug up the whole strand and Ooh. cut it. Ooh, is co- copper? Yeah, I know people like steal copper wire sometimes. It must be yep. pretty expensive. Yeah, yeah. That yep. I always get. I always get nervous when I'm digging. I had a big project in my backyard uh either last summer or two summers ago but they i had the same thing i had people come out and mark where the gas line and water lines all were and so like i kind of remember like generally where where they were but anytime i get close i always get very nervous there's a a fire hydrant on the corner of my property so i know there's a big oh, ass yeah. water line like yeah that's somewhere in my yard but yeah it's scary you you gotta <sighs> I mean, you just got to be naive about it, I think. And yeah. or, and then 
and don't overreact because then when you overreact like I did and then you file a dig inspection after you've dug and then you're impatient <laughs> like I am. So instead of waiting four days for them to show up, you just keep going anyways. Yep. And now I'm stuck in this, you know, rock and hard place where I have to try to dodge their inspection. I don't even know if there's like a fine. Could there be a could they arrest oh. me for now that I've alerted them that I was digging and I didn't do the call before you dig? If it was from I the city, like, maybe. But I, I think I mean, CenturyLink. Well, I don't know. CenturyLink is Century. such a they, they'll probably find you no matter what. Yeah, I was gonna say they're gonna probably th- bury me next to Terry uh. in the pit below my fence. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, well, you're like me, where you you get going on a project and and you just don't want to stop until it's done. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I can't. Or else I won't get back to it. I mean, especially right. something as laborious as you know, digging out building fence a fence and building Dude, a fence. Those, that sucks. Yeah, yeah, that's hard work. Yep, yep. Speaking of laying to rest, however, uh, let's talk about some farewells. And I think the first one that's interesting enough to talk about and. Maybe doesn't so directly apply to Oregon State, but that would be uh, the death of amateurism in college athletics. Yeah. It was this week. So today is Monday, May 27th. We did mention at the beginning this is Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. It's the Memorial Day scaries for those who usually have the Sunday scaries. It's even worse because today's one of those days where you're like, it was sunny. It's a barbecue day. It's a Mm. celebration of, you know, America and our heroes. And now I get to go back to my job, right? Like it's yeah. it's cool. it's a it's a rough one. Uh, but on May twenty third, so four days ago, the NCAA and the Power Five, including the Pac twelve, mm-hmm. agreed to a deal that will allow the schools to pay players for the first time ever, yeah, in the history of college athletics, and they will. Uh, be paying players up to, I believe, roughly twenty million dollars per year per program, depending oh, upon shit. a revenue sharing plan that will be obviously to be determined at a later mm-hmm. date. There is a lot to unpack and a lot of unknowns yeah. around what this actually will entail and what this will impact. Yeah, I think the the like the, the big point of this is is this is just a tip of the iceberg because so. if you're opening the doors to allow universities to pay athletes in any way beyond education and directly referring to it as revenue sharing mm-hmm. that will just open the floodgates and mm-hmm. like the NCAA has got to protect its ass at this point it is totally backed in a corner when it comes to the ex athletes and current athletes and everyone else breathing down their necks. Yep. The universities are trying to figure out is there a, a better way to navigate NIL, which has only been created out of necessity because of the fact that there was no pay structure for universities to redirect funds that they had earned on the backs of athletes back to those athletes. Yeah. But now, can you still call a college athlete an amateur? No, absolutely not. No, they're getting paid. Like that yeah. isn't the whole thing with amateurism. Like you're not getting paid. You're, I mean, the idea is that you're playing for the love of the game. But like, yeah, the whole concept is you're not getting paid. And now they are. Um, dude, I, I don't know what this means. I know schools operate on somewhat slim margins. So... I don't know. It almost feels like specifically football is going to have to be its own entity and it's probably going to have to be split up like completely from the structure of the university. Like it will be its own totally separate thing. Um, And you might see like the whole athletic program go that route. I agree. I agree. But I also think that if football splits off and that is the end all be all of the, you know, uh, splitting of the university and amateurism and the student mm-hmm. athlete from athletics and an yeah. athlete, professional athlete, that 
everything outside of football could also get left in the dust. And yeah. if football is the driver for media deals, if it is the driver for attention and revenue for a university and the rest mm-hmm. of their athletics programs, mm-hmm. well, who's who's offering TV money to like volleyball? Who's offering yeah. TV money to men's soccer, wrestling? Yeah. Like yeah. At, at this point, all the money is just going to go to football then if it splits mm-hmm. off. Mm-hmm. So there has to be something done by the universities to say, okay, yeah, we're rev sharing. Yeah, athletes are being paid. Yeah, we are paying athletes as employees, mm-hmm. whether it's football or not. Football operates in its own conference and structure. Mm-hmm. However, we all operate under one umbrella media deal or a couple of umbrella media deals that trickle down to the off seasons that have coverage for the other sports that also get paid, that also have rev sharing. Yeah. But what I'm curious about is how does this change the student athlete? Because we talk about it all the time about how special these athletes are for choosing Oregon state. And one of the mm-hmm. biggest reasons they choose Oregon state is because they love the school. They mm-hmm. love the community. They, they, they like the major, right? Mm-hmm. And if the community and the school and the major don't matter and it's all money. Mm-hmm. I'm mean, not going to say it won't matter completely, but like this could change a lot. I mean, it could change a lot around anybody ever becoming a powerhouse that isn't already. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Well, I think, like you said, there are so many unknowns. I think the biggest questions to me that need to be answered are number one, like what does this do to NIL? Because I think there is a big part of not just like Oregon State and Washington State, but I think most of college football or college athletics feels like NIL needs to have the reins pulled back. I think unless you're like Ole Miss or Michigan or Ohio State, like that, that are very obviously taking advantage of NIL and using that to their advantage. Um, I think most of the college sports fans want NIL to be reined in to some degree, and like, does or this just add a level of transparency? That? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's what, be really that's maybe the see. back door that could also be the back door motivation around this. Like, without it, actually saying it, like, fine, we'll pay the players here. Yeah, rev sharing plan, money mm-hmm. to the players for the mm-hmm. money that they are earning, the money that they're attracting. Yeah. By the way, now that money's funneling to players. NIL goes through that same channel, right? It might yeah. not be from the, the same that same pot, but yeah, we're gonna just we're gonna manage the money going to players in house. We're gonna yeah. name image likeness will reflect with the a percentage of revenue that that player earns, maybe. Yeah, but yeah, like, and but I think NIL as a current concept was a stopgap until something like this occurred, mm-hmm. and then it will allow players to not just make money from TV revenue that they're, that they are earning, Mm -hmm. uh, but it will also open the door for them to just negotiate any sort of endorsement. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 100%. I think you're right in the fact that NIL is probably going to go in house. That seems like it would make the most amount of sense. The other thing that just sort of like came to my head when this, all sort of came down a couple days ago was um, if like, so, okay. So you have the big 10 and the sec talking about, or the rumors swirling about potentially breaking off from the NCAA and just like creating their own thing, especially for football. And if that sort of transpires, the NCAA, I mean, the NCAA is sort of a joke as is right now. And you could see a world where the NCAA just sort of disintegrates and there's like not really Especially a governing power. body. Yeah. Right. Right. Like there's not really this governing body. And so the rules be like become a little bit more ambiguous. And so then it's like, I know, I know you said it's like a $20 or I'm sorry, a $20 million cap that's put on this, this pay. But like, if there's no governing body, does that mean that then it's really up to like the States for state schools to decide like 
you can spend X amount of money on athletics in paying players. And so like, if you have Oregon that wants to say like, you can have $40 million and you have Michigan, the state of Michigan that says you can spend $15 million. Like, I don't know that, that just, just sort of an interesting dynamic of something that could play out. Um, And like, how does NIL supplement? Because I don't think NIL is going away, right? Like, well, NIL, the concept like, of NIL isn't going to go away. The, like, yeah. the concept of, hey, you made a name for yourself. You're yeah. popular. You have an audience. You are yeah. becoming a brand. We wanted mm-hmm. to leverage that, that celebrity. Yeah. That is, I mean, that is the, like, what has made marketing tick since it was invented is yeah. finding an audience and a celebrity uh, or someone who has some sort of celebrity and leveraging them for your own gain. Right? Yeah, and so and people are willing to transact that because they will be paid as part of participating within that process, and right. so I think athletes will start to do that more. So, will that bring more transparency? I don't know. I don't. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe, maybe there will be money on the table that people it, it'll be reported, right? Like, hey, so and so got two million dollars to do yeah. a bunch of ads for Gillette or. Yeah, you know, beats by Dre or whatever. Like they, they might go that route, or it could just be all like, "Hey, whatever, just do your thing." Like we're sick of governing all of this. The only thing that we're governing now is you've got twenty million dollars coming from us. Everyone shook hands and walked away fairly unhappy, but at least not at each other's throats. Yeah, almost like um, uh, open doors would be the spot to go to or something like open doors where companies can a go marketplace. There. Yeah. Yeah. Marketplace. And then schools would like take the money that's coming from the boosters along with the state uh, or I guess for private schools, just the money that's coming in from the boosters and then state schools, like the money that you can spend as a state school. Um, and, and just like legitimately just pay players like, Jabari Johnson signed a contract for $1.5 million to be Oregon state's quarterback. Like it would be that as opposed to there's, he is getting NIL money and we're not sure how much. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And who knows, maybe like, maybe those contracts will coincide with offers of like, Hey, what if we offset 50% of the cost of tuition for you to go to school at half cost, but you still have this big fancy contract so you can go to college and, play or yeah. just take all the money and you don't come to class and we don't care because you're not a student <laughs> athlete you're an employee and yeah. then i think that's why also this 20 percent rev share is not an admission of them becoming employees that mm-hmm. student athletes if anything mm-hmm. it's another pushback on it because mm-hmm. it isn't a direct pay it's rev sharing but mm-hmm. it's also revenue leaving the university yeah. and going to student athletes and so it is the first step going in, and I think it is the first step to the death of amateurism in college athletics. And if anything, it is dead. It's dead now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a, it, you could argue that it was dead when NIL um, was made legitimate. But, okay, so rev sharing, that means that they aren't employees of the school, which means that they wouldn't get, um, like, benefits, right? Yeah. And, uh, no benefits. and okay, state schools know like pension. Not yet. And the thing, and the thing that I was thinking about too is like, let's say, you know, w- player X is just not cutting it, and uh, the school or the coach teams like, we don't want to pay this player anymore. We're gonna bring in this transfer. Like, if he's an employee, like, do you have the rights to fire that person? Because that's essentially what you're doing. It's right. just firing somebody. So yeah, real interesting. Rev share definitely makes that a little bit more um in favor of the schools, though, I would say. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But at least it's yeah. a it is a step in the right direction to gain the players though, the money that they're earning. And I think doing that transparently is probably the the best outcome. And so we'll see if that comes to fruition. We'll see what comes next. We'll see what kind of doors this opens. But I think it's gonna mm-hmm. take a long time. I also don't think it'll take as long as we thought uh, yeah. it could take. I mean, the first domino has fallen. And I I said to you and 
Terry, that I think that we will see NIL cease to exist as we currently know it faster than it came into existence. And that could be pretty quickly. Mm. Um, yeah. Moving on Good to point. another farewell who what has ceased to exist nearly as fast as it came into existence. Do you like how <laughs> I did that? Yeah. It's the Pac 12 baseball tournament. Uh, we had uh, a love hate relationship with this tournament. I loved the idea of a tournament for baseball. Yeah. I love Scottsdale Stadium. I love it. I thought it yeah. was a great match. And then we realized it could be 117 degrees in May. Yeah. It's still 106 or 108 at 10 p.m. at night. And delaying yep. games until 1 a.m. was a really bad choice. But I thought these last couple of seasons and these last couple of tournaments ha- had very less drama around them, especially weather-related drama. They mm-hmm. seem to be being pulled off pretty nicely, but I just mm-hmm. could still never wrap my head around the round robin, whatever pool play thing they had. Yeah, I could never tell you how we could win out of our pool except for just as long as we don't lose. But that doesn't yeah. seem that is really the case of pool play in round robin level like tournaments. There has yep. got to be some backup plan and I feel like every time we were there, I could not tell you our backup plan. So, no. What were your thoughts? Final thoughts on the Pac-12 baseball tournament <laughs> that uh, is no longer with us? Yeah. Oh man, it uh, I, it felt like it was becoming something. Um, and uh, I mean, Oregon State fans always travel well. There are a lot of Oregon State fans there. Um, I don't know. I don't really think you could put it in a major league park if you moved it out of Scottsdale. Although Scottsdale is such a cool spot. That's a, you need a destination. Yeah. Scottsdale. Maybe go to, yeah, you're right. maybe go to Vegas. Yeah. And play in the Las Vegas, what is it, 51s? Yeah. Las Vegas. Yeah. Uh, play in their stadium. That would be cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I agree. The round robin was set up a little weird, but – with nine teams, I don't know how else you would set it up. Uh, I mean, I guess you could have sort of a convoluted like uh, tournament where certain teams get buys along the way. Um, but yeah, like unless you were the top seed, in order to guarantee yourself into the next round, you had to win both games. And um, yeah, for basketball, that makes sense. For football, that makes sense. For baseball, it's just such a random it's a crap sport. Shoot. Yeah, it's a crapshoot. Like, yeah, yeah. That it's it's. I would say it's much tougher to win that way if you are a um, like a top seeded team, which is why yeah. I and we'll get into this in a second. Yeah. But that that is why I don't think that Oregon State, Oregon State Twitter, or the NCAA. Uh, college committee uh, or NCAA tournament committee should have knocked Oregon state down for losing a game to a Stanford team that had an incredible pitcher. Um, It's just like, (laughs) yeah, coming, coming out of a conference as a top one or two seeds being knocked out in pool play should not be looked at as like a catastrophic uh, showing at the PAC 12 tournament, but yeah, it's. I agree with you. It's it's a cool concept. There is no other real like tournament for baseball, like professionally. I think that people pay attention to. So it is a, a really cool uh, idea, just in sports in general. Yeah, yeah. I think that they were on the right track. I think they were fixing a lot of the issues. One that you can't predict, though, of course, is the weather. Mm-hmm. But I love the location in Scottsdale. Old Town Scottsdale is great. It's fun. Yeah. And Los Olivos is, you know, maybe not the best high quality Mexican food, but man, I will eat there every day if I could for the rest <laughs> of my life because their chips and salsa are the best thing possible. After oh. sitting in the sunshine in Scottsdale Stadium, you just walk a couple blocks to Los Olivos and boom, you're on your way. But oh, uh, at the same time that we lost the Pac-12 baseball tournament, 
we officially had the final live event for the soon to be defunct Pac-12 network. Yeah. And at least as we know it. Mm-hmm. Um it was a pretty sad uh closing after the game talking about um you know the Roxy Bursting was like talking about how he grew up watching the Pac-10 and then he went mm-hmm. to Cal and he called like Cal games on the radio and how he um w- you know was honored to be one of the earliest hires for the Pac-12 network and then he's like you know it's been an honor to bring you guys I think they said 9,000 live events since Jesus. it launched yeah yeah and a lot well so it launched 12 years ago which is symbolic for it being the pac 12 and now it's yeah. gone so it was really just the 12 year pac 12 mm-hmm. network yep. um and they but they showed a little replay of the the first brought or the first of uh i guess show broadcasted on the pac 12 network when they launched and I remember watching the launch and being like, finally, some respect for the Pac-12. <laughs> we have our own network. Look how sick this is. I can't believe it. It's going to be so awesome. Classic games, interviews, like yeah. just every sport. Because there was a time that even like football games weren't broadcast on TV for, yeah. for the Pac-10. Yep. Like not that long prior to 2012. So... I was so excited for it, and then rewatching all this stuff made me so bummed out. And I just, I mean, I think I feel so much gratitude for all the producers, the hosts, the reporters, the analysts, everyone working behind the scenes at Pac-12 yeah. Networks. I, I mean, I truly feel like it was a phenomenal product. What 100%. they did was top of the line. Uh, effort for any yeah. collegiate conference network they blew them all out of the water yep but no one could watch them but it seemed seemingly me so yeah yeah that was that, the downfall 100 percent. and i think the pac-12 network uh, you you hear the name and people sort of like groan or roll their eyes or uh, there's a lot of frustration behind the pac-12 network but the talent on the pac-12 network was truly amazing uh, and I the technology. Watch, yeah, I don't watch a whole lot of the Big Ten Network or the SEC Network or the Longhorn Network, but I have watched them. And it just felt like the personalities on the Pac-12 Network uh, were, for lack of a better term, just better and more interesting. Um, I think yeah. that uh, they did a much better job of making sure that each school was represented uh, more yes. so than some of the other conference um, networks. Um, but yeah, man, it is, it is sad. I know, um, you know, we both grew up on the West coast as fans of teams in the PAC 10 and uh, just like, I don't know, not, not even watching Oregon state games, but watching like Stanford versus Arizona state and hearing that um, the, like that, the music that you would hear on Fox sports Northwest or Fox sports Bay area or whatever it may be. um, Like that's just going to no longer be the case. And yeah, like some, some of the schools are going to be in the same conference, but um, there is no, (laughs) yeah. yeah. Clearly that's maybe the discussion of things that could change too, but. Yeah, we won't true. talk about farewells yet. Maybe somebody yeah. will address some of these uh, secondary conference farewells for yeah. these uh, treacherous ten. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I feel like the network did such a great job with pretty much everything it promised, except for getting in to the living rooms of everybody. Yeah, and obviously that's where you make your money. That's where mm-hmm. you build a brand. And that's where you live or die. And that's yep. where the Pac-12 network died. That's where the Pac-12 died. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, you look at the, the, the technology, you look at the talent. I would say that both of those things rivaled, if not beat, every other college conference network and maybe some main 
mainstay networks. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to their, you know, B le- B list, B level technology and talent. Mm-hmm. These guys, everybody the Pac-12 networks were just top notch, absolute pros. And so I hope that they stick around in some capacity with the new Pac-12. Um, yeah. given the Pac-12 networks is still going to be a production arm of mm-hmm. the Pac-12 conference. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I I really do uh feel sad that this was yeah. such a missed opportunity. And now we see the ramifications of that missed opportunity. But I, I feel like that the, the people who work at Pac-12 Networks, the people who've devoted themselves for the last 12 years to be, telling the stories of the Pac-12 athletes to get behind the scenes, to to seemingly be invested in every game they're covering. Yeah. Like, I mean, they were their collateral damage in all of this. And that's their careers. It's not right. just their fandom. That's their right. careers. Right, right. One and, and a lot of them are fans of one school or another that are in the Pac-12. So there's that plus their careers. You're right. Um, I just hope that it does stick around in some capacity. I know Oregon State and Washington State are trying to use it as leverage um, to either continue the Pac-12 or join another conference and bring that with them. Um, I just hope that if it does continue – um, and, and truly continue as a, an entity that they maybe go back to their original philosophy and lean in on the Silicon Valley aspect of it. Um, and you were talking about the technology being second to none. There's so much new technology coming out right now. I just think like that would be such a smart move to, to sort of revisit that initial philosophy. Yeah, of partnering up yep. with some of these bigger tech companies. Yep, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, speaking of partnering up, speaking of somebody that was a now really lifetime partner uh, of the Pac-10, Pac-12, uh, we sadly had to bid farewell. This morning we heard the news. Uh, I think all of us at Belliger Beeves felt strongly a strong sense of sadness about this news uh but the late great bill walton has passed away after a battle with cancer he was 71 years old and he was a mainstay with the pac-12 network for a long time he's been a mainstay for being the biggest cheerleader for the pac-12 conference yeah and yeah, he's gone. And sad yeah. it's a, it's a sad world to be in beyond his affiliation I think with the conference that we love, that he loved, but also that he was just a one of a kind human being. And I think people had their own mixed feelings of how much they enjoyed his rants or his quirks or his political views or his local municipal views <laughs> like it's okay to have a mixed feeling about the human, but the greater body of work of his life, he is going to be a massive loss uh, in so many regards beyond just college athletics. So I uh, would, yeah, just, I just want to say that, you know, I think that Bill Walton is, uh, is and was the one person that I constantly thought about with the Pac-12 breaking up. Yes. And I wondered very consistently, how does he feel about this news, this announcement, this Mm -hmm. deflection? Mm -hmm. And I'm in the silver lining kind of, I don't know, twisted way. I'm glad he doesn't have to live to see it because I don't think this would be something that he – would have stomached because it was, this was his love. Yeah. This conference was his love. So yeah. Big loss. Yeah. And I know Benny for you and Blazers lore as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, brought I, us uh, I, I, only championship. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he was the guy to deliver. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I've heard about Bill Wallen for my whole life and not just yeah. because I was, I was not a Blazers fan. I didn't grow up in the Northwest, 
My parents went to UCLA. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad reminded me today that uh, at one time at the San Francisco Saloon in Santa Monica in about 1979, 1980, my mom and dad shared a beer with Bill and some and several <laughs> other ex UCLA players at the San Francisco saloon. They got to meet him. Also found out that my brother-in-law's dad, uh, shout out Gary. Uh, he went on a double date with Bill Walton once. No way. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. So I never asked for, for these, but JP, please play five seconds of box of rain by the grateful dead for one of the biggest deadheads out there that I've ever heard of. Look out of any window. There you go. He, Love he, it. Not only, not only did Bill Walton, um, was he a, a champion for, or he championed the, the Pac-12, the Pac-10 and the Pac-12, um, and really was just like, I don't know if there was another person out there that was as much of an advocate for a conference as he was for the Pac-12 well before the all the split up started to happen. Um, but he, I don't know if you know, you probably do, given the UCLA uh, tie, but he had a huge problem with being able to like speak coherently and uh, be able to um, have the confidence to speak, especially to like the press. And um, he was talking to, I think it was a, a, a therapist of some sort. Um, and the therapist gave him the advice, something to the effect of just say what's ever on your mind. Like stop second guessing what's what you're going to say and how it might offend or hurt somebody's feelings or whatever. Like just say what's on your mind. And man, did he take that advice? <laughs> like, yeah. the, the, but, but I, I really feel like it allowed him to live his best life. Like he seemed to do what he wanted in the way he wanted um, and had a great time doing it. So while we do and will miss him, I think um, that he probably lived the life that he wanted to live. And um, that is something that, uh, you know, I think we can all be really happy about. Yep. And I think just the fact that, uh, you know, he was constantly being himself, mm-hmm. I think he opened up a lot of people's attention and eyes to viewing sports beyond the competition, viewing Mm -hmm. a competition beyond an outcome and really trying to understand, at least look at and uh, hear out the perspective of there's something bigger and better and greater happening right now beyond this basketball game and going on in front of us. And whether it was talking about the, cities he was in or the communities or stories or anecdotes Mm -hmm. it made everything feel so much bigger than a bucket that was just scored yeah and i think he had a great way of helping you see the bigger picture of life uh especially through sports and especially through our conference um and he was a big he was a big advocate for oregon state he was a big advocate for corvallis Yep. Huge. Um, mm-hmm. One of the quotes that, uh, yeah, I loved. I, I remember him saying this, and he's, he's he he did have a tendency to recycle some of his thoughts on TV. <laughs> um, and so you'd hear a few of his quotes or phrases time and time again, and again, but that was part of the charm. That was part of what I at least loved tuning into any Bill Walton called game. But, uh, you know, one of them is, is a quote, every trip to Corvallis, is a journey back in time where the values of tradition and loyalty are still held in high regard. It's a place where you can feel the heartbeat of college sports. Yep. And that to me, sends chills down my back, man, because he nailed it on on the head. He nailed the idea that 
what is the heartbeat of true college sports was the loyalty. It was the tradition. Mm-hmm. And we're losing sight of that. And I think what we'll lose sight of eventually as well is all of those bigger picture aspects of the competitions unfolding in front of us and what they signify and what they actually mean. Yeah. One, because we won't have a, a great storyteller, whether or not it was easy to follow uh, or not. Uh, we won't have a great storyteller like him here to help usher us through those stories. And um, I just, yeah, I, I mean, it's one of those like points where you you do realize how big of a loss it is beyond, oh, he was a funny commentator. Oh, he's a legend uh, as a basketball player. Like what he was able to bring to viewers and fans was a sense of community beyond just you know the 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 bounds of your city or your school it was the conference yeah. if anyone invented back to pack it was bill walton <laughs> and it was not for oregon <laughs> that is true i will say there are a lot of good uh, sports commentators out there, whether it's, you know, Bob Costas or Mike Tirico or Scott Van Pelt, like there are a lot of real class acts, but I would never tune in to a, a sporting event to listen to any of them. I would tune in to a sporting event to listen to Bill Walton. He just like, he was such a goofy dude. And I feel like there are a lot of like people out there that strive to be different, to create a brand or to be noticed or to just be, to get noticed, I guess. Um, But I have all the confidence in the world in saying like, that was just who he was. Yeah. Um, How, how could it not be like that? You, that is, that's not an act. That's just who he was. If you listen to any of his broadcasts, any like his counterpart would have so much trouble just trying to keep up with a what his what he was talking about, but be <laughs> just like his his energy, and um, it just made for such a great viewing experience. I thought. Yep, I agree. Yeah, I agree, and that is a very very good point to call out is that he did essentially make appointment TV from a for a, a commentator, and that's that is an incredibly amazing feat. Because yeah. you don't ever hear about somebody tuning in for a sporting event just because <laughs> there was a commentator on it. Unless it was like a celebrity commentator, then maybe I'd understand. But he was appointment TV, uh, whether it was as a commentator or an athlete. Um, yep. And I, yeah, I think on behalf of all of us, we'll just say we will miss you, Bill. Thank you for your contributions to society, to the conference, to Oregon State, to to sports fans, and to anyone anywhere who just wants to be themselves and strives every day yes. to do so. Appreciate you, Bill. Yep. What one last thing I want to share about him, and and I think <laughs> you will really appreciate this. Let's is, hear it. I saw I saw a quote, um, or maybe a story with a quote. Uh, but it essentially was somebody that was in the bathroom. They happened to run into Bill Walton and uh, they looked at someone and they go, Hey, that's Luke Walton's dad. And Bill (laughs) Walton turns around and he goes, that's the biggest honor I've ever received. That's the biggest honor I've ever heard. Um, So just like, dude, that is, I think that says it all about Bill Walton. Yeah. I thought that was really cool. Selfless. Selfless. Yep. 100%. Yeah. All right, Bill, rest in peace. Um, rest in peace. Uh, moving on, it's not going to be you know, as easy as it sounds, but moving on to the diamond, uh, we did touch on the Pac-12 baseball tournament. We'll give a couple quick thoughts. Uh, also talk about the road to Omaha, which starts this Friday, and yep. uh, then we'll get out of here. But uh, before we do, we'll do a quick hit of seam headed. So. If you haven't yet heard in any of our episodes since baseball and softball had began their 2024 seasons, check out Seam Headed. They have some of the best merch and apparel for baseball and softball enthusiasts on the planet. They've got sweatshirts, T-shirts, great designs, uh, clever, clever plays on words, and... 
They also have a one of a kind belligerent beeves collection. That means it's made for you, the listener, the viewer, because one, we don't make any money from this. All we like to do is just support small business. Even though Benny works at Amazon, this is his retribution (laughs) is he supports small business on our podcast and seam headed is a small business. They also do a great job and they also have a belligerent beefs collection. They've got cool t-shirts like the Benny with the giant baseball shades. They've got the home plate of Corvallis map shirt. They've got the beaver swinging a baseball bat in black and orange reminiscent of the MLB logo. It's awesome gear. And when you make your first purchase at Seamheaded and use the discount code at checkout, Chopum. If you don't know how to spell Chopum, you don't know how to spell hope. So <laughs> when you get to checkout, plug in Chopum. Can't spell it without hope. And you will receive the absolute noisest discount in the game. 31% <laughs> off. That means you're paying how much, Benny, for uh, for retail? 69%. Nice. Nice. 69%. That mean, not off, but you pay 69%, which is way cooler than a 69% way discount. Because then that means you're only paying 31%. And which is that's what well, that's boring, but you get 31% yeah. off to pay 69% on your seam headed purchases. Chop them, check out seamheaded.com. All right, now we've started to talk about baseball. Let's talk about baseball. Talk about it. We had a week, we had a week. Yep. We started the Pac-12 tournament. Was that Wednesday morning, 10 a.m. Wednesday morning Pacific time? That's right. We had a rough go on that game. Uh, but we, as we previewed a bit last week, we already knew we were playing on Thursday, Friday. What day was that? Anyways. Uh, we, yeah. We played. Thursday. We knew we'd play Arizona State game two. I never, ever in my wildest imagination thought that we would just play both games and end up in a position of waiting to see if Arizona be- beats Cal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what it came down to at the end because the Beavs lo- lost control of their own destiny. Mm-hmm. But Benny, what were your thoughts on the first two games? Yeah, I mean, like I said before, I think it's really difficult to um it's a it, it, there's a lot less predictability in a baseball tournament where essentially like you have to win your first two games. It doesn't really matter who you're playing cuz anything can happen. One one pitcher on one team can determine the difference. And Sanford's pitcher did pitch very well. And I will say Arizona State's pitcher pitched well too. Um, it is concerning that our offense was so quiet, especially having erupted in the Arizona series. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's a little dicey, I feel like going into the postseason. Um, but with all that being said, like, I, I, I just point back to like men's or women's college, but like just college basketball in general, if you're a number one seed in a conference going into the tournament, especially if you're in a power five conference and you get knocked out in the quarterfinals, like that's not good. (laughs) That's not good. Um, But this isn't that this is different. And uh, it's, I put a little bit of weight into it um, because Arizona state and Stanford are both, less like UC Irvine's better than both of those schools for sure. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, 
it I certainly it did not give me faith that a, a road to Lexington for the super regionals is a given. Uh, I'll just say that. <laughs> yeah, I I didn't leave the Pac-12 tournament feeling dismayed or excited. Yeah. I think what it left me with again was more questions. Mm-hmm. Like and I, I've come to the realization that the reason why I have these questions all the time about what is this team capable of, it's because I have still yet to see them put it all together. Like I have mm-hmm. still not seen the pitching dominate the way that we've seen them dominate. And then we also consistently put up like 10, 15, 16 runs. Mm-hmm. We've done it once or twice. We've done them individually multiple times, but there's been little overlap, let alone in the same series of games Mm -hmm. of us just doing all of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what you need in the postseason at this point. And like you alluded to, Benny, it is the postseason now. The road to Omaha begins today. Well, it it really began today. And it starts this Friday. On Friday, uh, what is that, May 31st? We, yeah, I think yeah. So. that's Friday, right. May thirty first, yeah. game one and two of the Corvallis Regional. We're hosting, dude. Yeah, we are hosting. Um, <laughs> we'll talk a little bit more about wh- where we fell uh, in the host ranks, but um, we're hosting, so we've got some games at home. It's time to pack Goss, Phil Goss. Goss got them all day long. Make make our opponents feel it when we're not even playing. Yes. Get there and be loud and just do what you can to rattle these players because our first game is Friday. We're game two. It's against Tulane. It's at 6 p.m. But we've got what? Tulane. Nickel State, which is hilarious. I just love that Nickel State always pops up in, in games with us. <laughs> We've got Nickel State, which I swear at one point had one L. And I swear at one point they also decided to say, we're actually not Nickel I, State. We're Nickels. <laughs> yeah, I thought and, that too. And I thought both of those things. Yeah, and now they're Nickel State with two L's and State. And now they're in our regional. How dare they do yeah. any of these things? Boo. But, Benny, how do you feel about our draw in the Corvallis Regional? Dude, I, so I don't like it at all. Uh, and, and we'll get into this, I think, a little bit more. But being the number 15 overall seed um, obviously has implications of where the Super Regional is. But it also has implications of who your number two seed is. Uh, and UC Irvine has been, at least in the latest college baseball rankings, uh or in most of them a top 20 team and yep. they have been on uh, a bit of a roll <laughs> uh going um you know at, at the end of the season granted like well i i can't even say like the competition was inferior because it was like uc or uh, i'm sorry you see uh cal state fullerton um cal state northridge uh and there's one other school in there where it's like, okay, they've Santa traditionally Barbara. been Santa, Santa Barbara. Yeah. And Long Beach state too. I don't know how yeah. those schools necessarily did this year, but traditionally Santa Barbara's schools good. are really good. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so Irvine scares me, uh, yeah. but I mean, Tulane and Nichols, I honestly don't know much about them. I think uh, like, I'll tell you, we better win on Friday, um, <laughs> right? Like we better win on Friday. We have to win on Friday. I do. I I would be incredibly disappointed if Oregon State doesn't make it to the Super Regionals, and I would be because we're playing at at Goss, and we are oh. just a different team at I Goss. I don't even want to even think about that possibility. I, yeah, because the because. The, what would come next will would be a lot worse than what will be probably coming next if we're just following the trends of every other yeah. program that ends their season. Yeah. But yeah, I agree. yeah I, Irvine is a tough draw, tough draw. Yeah. 
they are the only top like 100 RPI school with 20 road wins. Oh shit, I did not know that. 20 road wins. So Niagara is has an RPI of they're 103rd in RPI and uh-huh. they have 23 road wins. Uh, but they play the majority of their games on the road because they're 23 and 12 on the road and they're 12 and 3 at home. And then you go back and you look at Irvine. They're 20 and 5 on the road. You want to call Ooh. this a neutral site and then there's just a host? Fine. They are 3 and 0 oh at neutral sites. And just to top it off, they're also very good at home. They're, they are 20 and 7 at home. Irvine is. Mm. A tough draw. Yeah. A a tough draw. We cannot lose to Tulane. We need to set ourselves up to have as many games and chances as possible to escape our regional. And as you talked about, Benny, because we're on a collision course for the winner of the Lexington Regional. And, of course, that's hosted by number two, Kentucky. But I like our odds there if we escape our own regional even if we have to go to kentucky because kentucky while they have a great record just like us they aren't the best at home they have the of the i think top 10 teams that are hosting they have the worst home win percentage of all of them. So Hmm. it's not like Oregon state where we win 24 of 26 at home. They've won 21 of 27. Every other school in the top five, even has only lost a max three games at home. So those will be tough to get in to go to on as a super and pull off a W. So I do like the odds of even if Kentucky, if Kentucky does make it out of their regional and we have to go out to, out to Lexington, I like our odds. What I don't like is the UC Irvine being in our regional. Yeah. Don't like that at all because they have the most to gain and the least to lose. And that is never a, fair fight for anybody who's on the flip side of that yeah that it has that um remember when auburn played in corvallis in the super regionals and auburn ended up winning that series um that's what it feels like to me whereas like that was an auburn team coming in if i remember right was a number two seed in the regional yeah i don't think they hosted their regional but it's like they came in with that same feeling of like nothing to lose. They were from the SEC, so they probably had a losing record getting into the tournament. Right. But they had, the, yeah, they like they had nothing to lose. And um, in Oregon State, it always feels like in baseball we have everything to lose because there's so much pressure put on this baseball team because they're really like our only team, our only uh, the only team in our athletic program that is historically just like good every year even on our bad years we're still good um and yeah i just don't like i don't like playing that sort of role where you have a team i think any team that comes out of the big west too is just always has a chip on their shoulder and that's not a team that you want to run into here no nope. um but i do so yeah i think Irvine's going to pose a really big test and I would not be surprised in the least bit if, if there is a final deciding game in the Corvallis regional. Right. And um, that scares me for sure. I do think the Kentucky, so Kentucky is one in three in their last four games. Um, And I mean, Here's the thing that I like I take issue with is th- if you look at their last four games. So they lost to Vanderbilt. That was their last regular season game. Vanderbilt wasn't ranked. 
Then they lose to number 11 LSU. They beat number two Arkansas and they lose to number 10 South Carolina. But it's, <laughs> it's like, how are those rankings legitimate? Because those schools are all beating up on each other. I mean, you have, <laughs> you have six teams from the SEC that are all ranked in the top 15. That's like, that's more than a third of the teams in the top 15 are SEC schools. I just, I feel like there is a true SEC bias. I think it's a hard oh, to gauge uh, where, where they are actually at as a team. Well, they, they, I, it, I just think everything it's overcomplicated by like how you perform against a certain team in a certain series and compared to the other teams, how they perform, but no one accounts yeah. for who was pitching, who was injured, who was hot, who was not. Yeah. And you just yep. end up with looking at like wins, losses, series, victories, series, losses, and you're stuck with just numbers. And yeah. so I would, I mean, why? Well, yeah. Why, why is Clemson not, you know, any better than Kentucky? I mean, they have a better home record. They have a little bit worse road record, but they have a better neutral site record and they have the like essentially the same overall record. <laughs> like like yeah. to put them three spots lower. I mean, there's maybe there's some science behind it and that we're just not privy to, but I just, I agree. There's, there's a bias. There's also, it's difficult to really rank them, but if they're just beating up on each other and they all have great records, you must be, you know, the cop out is like, well, they must all be good. So let's just yeah. rank them in some order, figure it out. Um, and let's just go from there. I What's crazy. What's crazy to me is that Kentucky's the number two team in the country in the polls. And not only did they not win the SEC outright or the tournament, they didn't even win their division in the SEC. Tennessee won the division in the SEC East and Kentucky was number two. So, I mean, just even furthering the point of just this SEC bias. Yep. Yeah. Well, we've always known there's a bias and, you know, they've, they've, they've had major network control for a long time. And that's evident, uh, not just with local reporting uh, or even any sort of publication reporting, but yeah, TV. But uh, yeah. you know, looking at looking at the number fifteen ranking and the implications, is there anything else beyond that that you feel needs comment? Uh, or do you feel disrespected by that? You alluded earlier talking and like, well, we didn't really like lose that bad to to go that far. We just didn't win in this weird format. <laughs> yeah. You... Well, uh, yes, I do feel disrespected, and I feel like I've uh, like I feel like I've kept my mouth shut to a certain degree of the disrespect that Oregon State has been feeling that had been getting just for the last year and a half. Um, but this is, I, I haven't seen an outright disrespect as egregious as this. And I get that the RPI shows that we're not the number six or seven team in the country. I, I get that. But, the, but all of the polls who, uh, none of them are computer polls. They're all uh, people that are giving their rankings. Um, and all of those had Oregon state as the number six or number seven team in the country, at least all the ones that I saw and Oregon state. Yeah. They lost to Stanford. They did beat Arizona state. So they lost one game that they probably shouldn't have, but they almost swept Arizona. There are three outs away from sweeping Arizona, who is a number one seed in this tournament. There were three outs away of sweeping them on the road. So like they people are like, well, they stumbled at the end of the season. No, they didn't. <laughs> they were nine. Yeah. They were nine and three to finish the season right. with a very close sweeping of a number one team. So yeah. and, and um, what like five five and two in their final series and tournament. Yeah, yeah, and uh, like so, I think a couple things are going on here. I do think that the committee looked at the Pac-12 and said that this is a shit conference, which. I do agree with to a certain extent that 
the Pac-12 was not very good uh, this year. Um, but Oregon State was really good, and they showed that they were really good, uh, especially as of late. I mean, after the Arizona series, I, I think I had said some of the effect of like, I feel yeah, like you, I feel good about going to the postseason. Like this, yeah. it, it's finally starting to be put together, and so, like, I would understand if they, if the committee said like, oh, the Pac-12 is not good. We're gonna put Oregon State as like a nine or ten seed. Like that would have sucked because we're still playing the super regional on the road, but we're not Maybe. getting drawn. Well. And I have a question for you about that after, but uh, if so, but we also wouldn't have a number, the number two seeded team be like a UC Irvine. Um, and it did feel like just such a slap in the face. Like that, that would be like putting, and not to make all these basketball analogies, but that would be like putting the number <laughs> six team in the country as like close to a number five seed in the tournament. Like that just, it, if people would be so confused by that if that happened. And I saw people on like Oregon state fans making the argument of, well, their RPI is really bad, but then they shouldn't have been ranked number six or seven. <laughs> like I don't get how it matters with the NCA selection committee, but not with these polls. So I don't know. I short answer is yes. I felt disrespected. Yeah, I the something needs to be ironed out here. Like the RPI stuff feels a little bit like BCS, right? And yes. it's like it's it's I'm I'm fine with that because if there's consistency mm -hmm. and it's it's applied across every discussion and every interpretation of how good a team is. I don't mm -hmm. mind a computer doing it. Hell, if you throw in everybody's results, if you threw in Somebody do this. I don't have the time to do this, but somebody please do this. Throw in every single, like, butterfly effect game result of any team that has some sort of nth degree connection and put all of those box scores into ChatGPT and, <laughs> and ask it to rank the top 25 to top 15, 16. I would love to see what it came up with. Yeah, I would love to see. I would love to know what kind of logic it used. But if you're just going to look at the numbers, fine. If that's a consistent metric, fine. It shouldn't matter one way or the other of like, well, this is just the number they got because of who they're playing. And that's the yeah. output of the results of the games they've played. Or versus, well, this is the eyeball test. And I saw this improve, or I saw this not improve. That's why I'm worried, and that's why they lost. And that's why I don't have faith in them being better than this other team they've never played, right? Like, both arguments are fair. Yeah. But they contradict each other so much that I just want, I just want consistency. I just mm -hmm. want one reliable source. And I think that's yeah. not just uh, that's not just strictly baseball. I think that it would be great to have some sort of true ranking system, like the BCS was attempting to be, uh, but with you know a broader scope of reality. And AI could be a component of that I, for sure. And and baseball would way, make way more sense to do that with than football. Agreed. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Football's a harder one to like just take a take a box score and you know elaborate out to say, well, how did this game actually go then? Yeah. Right? Like there could be so many things that don't end up in the box score that mattered in a football game and had a huge right. impact in the outcome versus baseball. Essentially every single move is measured. <laughs> Everything everything is on paper. Yeah. Yeah. So I agree. I agree. But maybe that'll come. Maybe open AI and the Pac-12 can partner up and for all games played in Corvallis or Wazoo next year. Well, well no, I guess Wazoo's going to the uh WCC for baseball. So any game oh, they are. played 
in Corvallis next year as the Pac-1 Independent Pac-1. Yeah. Then we should have AI determining everything for us. And we can use NVIDIA's supercomputer they're put on campus and use OpenAI as a partnership with Silicon Valley. And then maybe Apple will take up our baseball games, put those on, uh, uh, you know, one of their two or three choices for Friday night baseball that they do uh, on Apple TV. Uh, Any final thoughts on baseball? I have one, but I'm going to pass to you real quick. Yeah. So uh, first I'll say uh, that the, so PAC 12 got in three schools, Arizona, Oregon, Oregon state. The Sun Belt got in four. Like, that's how bad this committee thought of the Pac-12. <laughs> and honestly, like, fuck Cal. But also, I kind of feel bad for Cal for getting left out, which is it's sort of – it's pretty crazy that they got left out. But well, the it didn't help thing, us. That explains a lot about us and USC. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Oh, God. I know. That's that's what I thought, too. USC definitely should have been in, too. Yeah. Um, but uh, when it comes to these super regionals, I'm looking at um, – so let me take a step back. I thought that everything was reseeded after the regionals. So, for example, like not that this will happen, but if the top eight seeds all lost the regionals, then Oregon State would host a super regional because they would be one of the top eight schools uh left am i crazy in that because when i look at wikipedia which i think it's a bracket though like they pair that's what i'm seeing on wikipedia yeah Yeah. it's the bracket we're paired with lexington regional yeah and then whoever comes out of the lexington uh and corvallis regionals with the highest ranking hosts Uh The super oh, regionals. Okay. Between so if, those two teams. Got it. Okay. So it wouldn't like if if Kentucky lost the regional, we would not still be playing in Lexington. We would be playing in Corvallis. Yeah. Okay. That actually works out so much better for Oregon State than reseeding. Cause then there is actually not a good chance, but there is a chance that they could host a super. Right. But it, I mean Kentucky is in the driver's seat. If they just win. Yeah. yeah. Right. They host the super regionals, and, which and, if we were top yeah. eight and we just won, we would host the super regionals. Yep. So yeah, that's now why it's we so have to beat Irvine, and not to you know overlook Nichols, Nichols State, Nichols with one L, or Tulane. <laughs> but if we can get past our own regional, yeah, and have to go to Lexington. I do like our chances playing Kentucky at their home. I do. I would, I would just feel so, so good to get, to knock an SEC school out, especially top five SEC school out. Yeah. And I think, I think that the team learned a lot about playing on the road and being uh, successful on the road with that Arizona Mm -hmm. series. So, and they they, they, they show they can do it. I feel like an area where I just, I know a lot of schools, every school has less confidence on weekday games as opposed to weekend games because of the starting pitchers. But I feel like that was almost exacerbated for Oregon State this year. Like our weekday games, I felt so unconfident (laughs) about those (laughs) games. Whereas like our, Definitely our our two top starting pitchers are can compete with anybody. Um right now. Right now. Especially. Yeah. And I think like that's sort of what matters. And that that does lead me to a question for you. And I saw this floating around. And, and I'll wait to give you my sort of thought on it until I hear yours. But people were saying like when you're playing Tulane, who is a very inferior school, do you roll out someone out there to be a starting pitcher that no. is not Aiden May? No. Yeah. I think no. I agree with you. Every game matters right now. Win yeah. every game. Mm-hmm. You you yeah. don't play poker in this. 
Yeah. Like this is, this is all the chips are in. So you have to play your best players every game from this point forward. I mean, Mm. we fucked around too much. Like that's why we're in this position to have to do that. I think if you're hosting mm, like in your, uh, you know, lock to host a super regional, if you come out of your regional, maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe I want to go like, you know, weekday starter, like in any way, but maybe you save May for some, you know, I don't know, final game, the deciding game. Yeah. But I think what you do now is you just have to run him out there if necessary for a deciding game. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you put him up game one and then you, you, if you need him, whatever game that is like four, then you mm -hmm. run him out there game four. Yeah, I think I agree with you. And it's interesting to think like, so if it, like if Oregon State's up, like let's say 8-0 at the end of the third, do you pull Aiden, save his arm, and then wear your bullpen out? Because that's where I have the most issues. The bullpen is shaky. And I know you you felt probably more so that way than I did um, but especially with, uh, the, the series at Arizona, but, um, like, I don't know. There's just so many ways to go about it. Irvine just scares me so much. And I like, I agree. You don't play poker here. Every game does matter because if it bites you and you lose to Tulane, like <laughs> then that, <laughs> then you're fighting uphill, uh, a lot. I think, I, yeah, I Bad. think you run out. Yeah, you run out May, and yeah, you know, oh, yeah. hope hope, you hope that to. he has hope that he has some really efficient innings. Get him out by like the you know fifth inning if possible. Save <laughs> his then, arm as much as you can. But then we run into the same issue. Even if we're up ten nothing in the fifth, no yeah. lead is safe. It seems. Yeah, with this team on no any kidding. given day, I think you just think what, you just say you're you're throwing. Until you can't. Mm-hmm. Yep. Sorry. I I think one. It's the postseason. Thing, yeah. And if you're if you're scoreboard watching, what I want to see is Nichols and UC Irvine having like a seventeen to twenty game where the relief <laughs> the bullpen is just completely depleted, and the starting pitcher obviously has thrown a lot of uh, pitches. Uh, I think that you hope that's that's what you hope for. So. Oh, yeah, or the and the reliever has all all the bullpen has thrown forty pitches each or something. But <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm into that. Uh, also, one thing we didn't we came out right after our episode last week, which was without Terry, and it's by far been our most successful episode. By the way, thank you for everybody. We got more five star reviews. We've got more subscribers on YouTube, <laughs> and we've had more views on YouTube uh, since that episode came out than any other episode. And it's clearly because y'all have to look at Terry. But I'm just kidding. Uh, I, Which is why he's things. buried in the back of JP's yard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> but one other thing that came out after that point was uh, that Travis Mazzano was named Pac-12 Player of the Year. Yeah. So, Shout out, Trav. Way to go. Boz. Boz is Mitch and the Darwin Boz. call him the Boz. Uh, and yeah, well deserved. I think well deserved. We'll see what other accolades are headed his way. We've talked quite a bit last week about the Golden Spikes and what that could mean for him, what could that could mean uh, for his career, the way that the teams and scouts view him um, and his legacy at Oregon State. All that's TBD. He's somehow fighting off 48 different semifinalists for that award. Uh, and, and there's supposedly some uh, rule and logic in how they decide a winner. We'll see. We'll see where it goes. But I still strongly feel like, yeah, Pac-12 Player of the Year was a lock. And Golden Spikes should be a lock. And number one overall draft pick should be a lock. And I think... Yeah the latter of which will be very much influenced by a very strong performance in regionals and super regionals. I feel more strongly that or more confident about the latter of him being the number one pick than being the golden spikes. The people that are 
at least if the people that are the committee and picking the teams in the tournament <laughs> have anything to do with the Golden Spike, I do not have confidence in that at That's all. That's true. That is true. That is true. All right. Uh, before we get out of here, we're going to give a shout out to the GOAT, our favorite, Jade Carey. Uh, she is competing in the 2024 Xfinity U.S. Championships. And that starts on Sunday, this Sunday, 4 p.m. Pacific. She'll be competing in the all-around. And this is like the thing that sets the thing, which is the Olympics. If they mm. perform well over this two-day competition, they could very much set themselves apart as being part of Team USA. So this is like the final tryout, in a sense. And everybody should tune in. Give Jade all your love, all your support. We all want to see her in the Olympics again. We know how oh, yeah. masterful she was last time. Um, and yeah, this is, uh, I guess, oh no, sorry. Just Friday night, 5 p.m. is when she's doing the all around uh, with the floor. And then the vault is on Sunday at 4 p.m. So they have clearly have all the events spread out over the weekend. Um, I don't remember watching the Xfinity U.S. Championships maybe ever in my life. Uh, but it's at Dickey's Arena in Fort Worth, Texas again, which feels like a trend. And then the uh, last part is it's funny that it's the Xfinity uh, Championships because I've just canceled Xfinity. So shout out to me. <laughs> shout out to me. <laughs> Cut in the cord. <laughs> love it that's which you because literally almost did i literally almost did yard. yeah right yeah. right and then yeah. i'm going to century link actually with quantum fiber um <laughs> but but yeah because of the death of the pac-12 network i have no need for xfinity and i do have a need though to watch this xfinity u.s championships so beaver fam tune in again uh she's competing in the all around and the four routines start on Friday night at 5 p.m. Hopefully she's on before Beaver Baseball. That way you don't have to choose between which one to watch. I would have to say that I would tune into Jay Carey on the floor because, one, it's a lot shorter, so you might as well pay attention and just watch the masterpiece unfold. But, two, she's a gold medal Olympian and might be having a chance to go back to do it again. So I would watch that. Uh, at least tune into that regardless of the score of the baseball game if she goes on after 6 p.m. And then concluding on Sunday at 4 p.m. at the start of the vault exercise or the vault event. And then, uh, yeah, well, I don't know. We'll find out soon after that if she uh, has a chance to make the team, I guess. So, um, uh, yeah, for Jay, yeah. let's give her – all the support we can. And for us, we are the Belligerent Beeves. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is episode 143. This has been episode 143. Terry may or may not be back next week. It all depends on how good his digging skills are. <laughs> or his flying skills and wings eating skills. But Ooh. I anticipate he'll be back. I feel like he's got enough desire to ensure he's back on this podcast. Um, this is Benny L 1986 and on everything, right? You're Benny L 1986 on, on every yep. social media channel. So Instagram, that's right. TikTok, X. I don't know. Are you on TikTok? <laughs> oh, I just have a TikTok account to watch videos. I don't post anything on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to see the videos that Benny's watching, follow him. They'll end up in your For You page. You'll love yep. it. They're hilarious. They're informative. They're, They're really well done. High yeah, production a lot of quality. Land, a lot of landscaping. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. And follow him on X at BennyL1986. Follow him on uh, Instagram and BennyL1986. Yep. And you can follow me at the underscore trail underscore J because I'm too trill and I'm real and too trill to be real. And that's on X on Instagram. I'm much more professional. It's just at JP Bertram. Uh, if you want to follow me on TikTok, 
I think I'm user one six eight four seven three two six nine. And uh, if you want to follow us, please do so. You can follow us on X at Belage Beeves. That is French for belligerent beeves. It's B E L L I G E Beeves. You can follow us on Instagram, belligerent beeves. You can follow us on TikTok, belligerent beeves. You can follow us on YouTube, which you might be if you're watching you us right now. Definitely you should. You are looking right at you. And follow, subscribe, uh, belligerent beeves YouTube, and. Remember, please, to give us a five-star review, subscribe, like our videos. Somehow that helps, yeah. too. Like our videos, like them, like them on everything, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, YouTube Shorts. If you don't see us on YouTube Shorts, nah, I doubt it. Call your YouTube provider. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> take it up with them. It's not our fault. <laughs> and also remember, oh, I guess Terry Horseman. Remember Terry Horseman. That guy. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> whatever his socials general, are. Remember. Yeah, whatever his socials are, whatever his middle name is, remember Terry Horseman. And then also remember that no matter what happens in the regionals, no matter what happens with Jay Carey at the Xfinity US Championships, no matter what cable provider you're using or not using, you can't <laughs> spell chop them without hope so chop them chop them do mine again chop them beef's back baby